yeah. what individual or unique considerations should athletes take into place in their training inside? The common thing that a lot of us do is, right, Amber, we think it's just an indoor ride. So, uh, <laughs> we, so we, we don't fuel it the same. We wear really bad old kit and then we get a saddle sore, uh, you know, and, and we, we do all these different things because yeah. it's just an indoor ride. But if anything, it's actually the highest amount of output, especially if you're using trainer road, because it's going to be training. This is going to be right. You know, it's scaled to your abilities. So really it's like probably the best time to fuel, to hydrate, to wear the best kit, to do all that stuff, because it is like the highest peak of performance, you know, that you're going to see till race day. But are there any special considerations along those lines or others, Andy, that you would say somebody would need to take concerning hydration in particular when they train inside? I think the biggest thing about hydration and indoor training is like in a like for like context, you generally do work harder. You've got way less airflow, even if you've got a fan, it's mm -hmm. often not as effective as the kind of airflow you get on the road. So it tends to push your core body temperature up sooner. I know that on the trainer, I can be sweating after easily be sweating quite hard after 10 minutes of relatively, you know, benign warming up compared with if I went and did that on the road. So unit of time per unit of time, you probably sweat more. Um, that might be in many people's cases offset though by the fact that you don't ride as long like although in recent times i've heard of a lot of people doing four hour five hour yeah. rides routinely on the on the training because they can't get out i mean i can't mentally do that because i'm i've 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 not got the goal there you know to keep me driven but good on the people that can that can mm -hmm. do that and can push out those sessions but i think if you're doing that then you do need to go into that with a plan. And I would, I guess if you want a rule of thumb, I'd probably say, look, if you're on the training for an hour or less, then it's probably wise to have a bottle of water there or something. But unless you're backing that up with another really hard session or coming off the back of another hard session, then not, there's not a lot you can drink or eat or anything that's going to influence your performance in that hour or even enhance your recovery dramatically you know you just kind of got to turn up hydrated and fueled and smash it out when when you get to two to three hours okay that's definitely becoming more more important but even even up at the well at the lower end of that even after a couple of hours probably drinking to thirst you know maybe a bit of electrolytes if you are a heavy sweater but listening to your body I would always after a longer session like that have a strong electrolyte drink mixed up ready to go so i could drink it afterwards to and to help my rehydration for recovery but i think during the session i would be largely driven by instinct you know if i was going to though do something for four or five hours or you know really kind of long stuff and especially if you're a heavy sweater you're going to need a plan because I think if you follow your instincts, you won't drink much in the first hour or two and that'll bite you in the backside later on. So that's where I'd be wanting to, to, to sort of do a bit of pre-planning and that's where understanding your sweat rate and stuff has, has some advantage because even if you start off with an arbitrary, I'm going to replace roughly, I want to replace roughly 50% of what I'm losing, you know, and if you're a, a one liter per hour person, over five hours, you predict that's going to be about five liters of loss. You're going to drink half a liter an hour to kind of mitigate that, which, which sort of, you know, for context feels like a reasonable guesstimate for me as a starting point, then, then you may not feel like drinking half a liter in that first hour, but you're kind of going to have to, if you want to keep on schedule. So, yeah. so I think that's where, whereas outdoors, especially if you do the majority of your training outdoors versus indoors, you've got a lot more, if you're an experienced rider, you've got a lot more rules of thumb you can fall back on because normally when I ride this route and this temperature, I take two bottles or I have to stop for a third or normally I can get around this route without a bottle. You can, you've got all those kind of heuristics that you've built up over the years. So I think it requires a bit less planning rather than a bit more. And I would say at the moment, if people are doing more indoor training, one of the things we've been doing with the athletes that we work closely with is encouraging them to do some analysis. So it's like, okay, we'll write down what you're drinking and eating on these sessions, weigh yourself before and after, start to write down how you feel about that, because we can come out of this period with some knowledge then on, on what works. And there's been a, there's a, a Norwegian um, triathlete that have been working with who's been doing a ton of that and learning loads you know for his Ironman performance which is really mm -hmm. cool he's built a spreadsheet and he's like putting in all of his data treadmill sessions bike sessions wattage how much he drank how he felt at the end how much body weight he'd lost 
And I think that's going to be a really valuable resource for him when he goes back outside and can start to translate that into actual strategies. You can control so many more variables when you're riding inside that yeah. you just can't control when you're outside. And yeah, so it's a good environment for that. On the on the note of evaporative cooling, and I guess we can kind of go over, it'd be good to go over the why we sweat, and, and but why doesn't, yeah. adding on to why we sweat, why doesn't evaporative cooling work as well when we're riding inside? I think the simple reason why it doesn't is that largely the, the airflow to take the evaporating sweat away from the skin is important, but also unless you're in a huge environment, um, your the humidity in the room where you're training will be massively influenced by, by your sweat rate. So we used to have a, a, hu a climate chamber, which wasn't humidity controlled. We could only control the temperature for doing testing in, in the lab. And what we used to find was if you put someone in there for like an hour and a half, the humidity could go up from an ambient of say, let's say, you know, 40% when you start the session to almost 85, 90% throughout that 90 minute period. Now it was a relatively small room with someone working hard, but I think essentially that, that evaporative cooling becomes less and less efficient because there's less of a gradient with which in the with the moisture in the air there's less of a gradient for that evaporation to occur so you start off in basically in an hour and a half indoors you kind of start in you know phoenix and you end up in miami or something like that because <laughs> it's just you know it, you, the, the conditions change dynamically while you're riding yeah this is something why and that's why it's so important to have a a I, I'm not sure you can have enough fans when you're riding yeah. inside because no, I'd agree. Yeah. Yeah, be, I think all of us probably agree with that Yeah, but because the main reason is we have like so much because a lot of it is about surface area, right? Yeah. And, and, and a bigger athlete is bigger, but also if they have more surface area, that means they have more cooling ability with greater mm. surface area. Right. So but it's only effective. That surface area is only helping you if air is moving over that. And when yeah. we're riding in outside, air is moving over every single part of us. Even if a yeah. sock is covering it, even if a jersey yeah. is covering it, there's still a greater amount of airflow than what we experience inside. So we just have that tiny little, you know, we have a small fan that's pointing at us or pointing at one specific spot, which is often our face, but then not pointing at the rest of our body. <laughs> mm -hmm. It really has a profound impact on your ability yeah. to perform. It, it does. And I think if, if people haven't got the ability to have as many fans as they'd like, or, or for, for whatever reason, you know, the space or just the availability of it, then it's worth remembering that one sort of side effect, one side benefit you get of getting hotter is that heat acclimation, blood volume boosting and all those sort of things. So you might have to, in, you might have to change the intensity of your ride and downgrade it a little bit but you still can get an enhanced training effect because actually training in indoors in the heat does give you some of the gives you some benefits that you don't get from riding outside which is why it makes it a bit more of a it's like a more potent form of training for yeah sure. like heat acclimation you need to adjust the intensity and your own expectations <laughs> yes yeah, that's the problem yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, honestly yeah. a, a z2 recovery ride so i i i I guess I, once again, more is always better in the mind of, <laughs> of, of all of us. And it's not correct, but I thought heat training. Awesome. I'm going to go straight into we, it here at our office. We have a, a shower that's relatively small. It's a, it's a tiled shower, uh, and it does not have much circulation. It has a fan, but of course I turned the fan off and I even turned the water on hot and I left the water yeah. on, but then there was a spot for me without the water to be able to train. And I put in a heater in there, of course, because once again, more is better. And I remember doing a Z2 ride, low Z2, and it was one of the hardest workouts I've ever done. And it was 45 minutes yeah. long. But in those 45 minutes, the amount of sweat my body was pouring out was substantial. And it was it's very difficult. So this also ties into, and, and this is a bit you know separate from this podcast, but if you do find yourself in this situation and you're training inside and you're wondering why it's so much harder, Many times it's because you don't have sufficient cooling and that does have a profound effect on what you're doing. So it's, it's important to keep that grain of salt handy and also to become a purveyor of fans and start to build them up, uh, <laughs> the, for us here in the United States. And I know that you can get them overseas in spots as well, but they're, they're con they're commonly referred to as blower fans. 
yeah essentially what they'll have is instead of like you know rotating blades they'll actually have like a spindle mounted uh array and that spins very quickly and it can push out a lot more airflow over your body so they're the lasco performance series is usually what we mm -hmm. use here uh, it's entirely unsponsored. It's just, uh, I'm sure we're going to get that question. So as far as which family recommend, so those are the ones that I have and two of them, three of them would be great too. If you can do it once again, do you, do you put one behind you as well and stuff like that? So you can get it on your back. I, I don't, but I should, uh, because that's one spot where you build up a lot of sweat is, mm. is off of your back. It, it, um, so it's, it's definitely, I think a, a good thing to do. The one thing that I've learned is that I don't just put one on my face. I try to put yeah. one so that it covers the largest surface area. And if you do only have one fan and it's not a very powerful fan, just try to position it in a way that it's going to move the most amount of air over the most surface area. That's probably best. There is a psychological effect for me, at least personally with mm -hmm. air going over my face. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but uh, physically speaking, I bet it's probably the most effective when we have it going over our body. If you like this video, subscribe to our channel and let us know with a thumbs up down below. If you didn't like us, give us a thumbs down, but let us know what we could do to improve in the comments. Absolutely. And if you want to become a faster cyclist, you should head over to trainerroad.com. It works. True story. That's true. Nate used to be slow and now he's fast. Sort of fast. Not as fast <laughs> as you. Still fast, Nate.